The books. Oh, I was lucky to have bought them long, long ago before they became hard to get. I heard that the final third book is especially expensive online now, and I don't recommend that people actually spend too much money on these because you might find them dry. They are packed with information, so good for those who love lore and want to write Transformers stories as accurately as possible. I stumbled upon Transformers Exodus and Exiles in my city's chapters, and I didn't even know at the time that it was connected to Transformers Prime, but it should have been obvious considering the way Transformers is written on the cover. Then it became undeniable when I ordered in the third book, and you have Prime Megatron's face in the reflection of Optimus's. I had a fan moment when I saw that. But here is the novel itself, and you can see at the top the official history of the war for Cybertron, which seems to nod at the first video game's title. And on the back cover, you can see that the book has been a bit loved. It is very much the backstory for Prime. But at the time I bought it, I really didn't know Prime in depth, so I wasn't sure. Out of the three books, Exodus is the quickest read. All of them are about the same width, but you can see that the text in Exiles and Retribution is much smaller. And there is something about Exodus that just makes it slicker. The events jump fast, the locations are constantly switching, so you're being hit by a lot very fast. With Exiles and Retribution, there are no jumps in time. You follow it live, and there are very few locations as they fight among the stars. So the thing about Exodus in particular is that there are so many things that clash with the line timeline, but I mean the video games in particular because there is no major issue with Prime. I could point out everything that went wrong with cohesion in the video games, but this video is already going to be long, so that will be a separate video. Today's focus is describing everything that happens in Transformers Exodus so that you have the knowledge. Chapter by chapter, you will hear what I believe to be the most correct summary of what happened before Transformers Prime. Now that this book was published June 22nd, 2010, and that the video game War for Cybertron, if Wiki is telling me the truth, was released the exact same day. Transformers Prime started November 29th, 2010, and it draws heavily from the books, at least being accurate to all the information about the characters' lives before the war. But there are so many major differences between the book Exodus and War for Cybertron video game alone that you basically have to choose your own canon. I personally find the book very detailed and well-written, even more sensical, so I take it as canon. But I can't force others into that decision if they really like War for Cybertron and follow Cybertron. But for example, I just can't go with the war being millions of years old in the game lore and somehow not be over yet. Transformers Prime and the novels only say centuries or millennia, and they go way into depth with things such as Megatron's discovery of Dark Energon. Honestly, they act more like the Prime selves in the books, such as Starscream's caution towards Dark Energon. And even though Optimus was very different back then as a Ryan Pax, you can clearly understand how he became the way he did. For me, written material would be more official than games, where the games could act like quick summaries while being very cool and entertaining to play. So because of these reasons, I push aside the games for the most part and substitute in the book material. There is even a comic depicting the High Council scene with Orion and Megatron, and while they use the War for Cybertron designs, the text is word by word from the novel. Perhaps consider War for Cybertron as a nice visual representation, but the novels as the plot representation. Exodus is a good read only the people super interested in the line continuity lore. Read reviews online and is often called dry and boring. Never give this book to anyone who does not know Transformers. Like with fanfiction, the author assumes you know the names and some concepts so they're not going to be explained. Even terms like altform and protoform are going to be hurled at you without pause. And Exodus is a fast book, I call it a blink and you miss it book. I've read through it about five times now, and only as I got older was I able to pick up the tiniest details. That's why I'm here to break it down, now in my slowest, most careful read-through. You know in English class or your country's native language classes, how you have to do novel studies and write 2,000 word essays? This is what I'm doing for you people, except it's going to be nearly 19,000 words. 5,000 subscribers special, I suffer for your education. Exodus is primarily set in the perspective of Optimus Prime, but called Orion Pax until he is announced to be a Prime by the High Council and feels like he is worthy of the title. Now anyone here watching who doesn't know what I mean, don't worry. I'm going to break it down to the basics. Now then, sometimes we get the perspective of others, of Megatron, Starscream, Soundwave, Alpha Trion, and even a comedian performing a show. Let's get going.
We meet the character Orion Pax, who works in the Hall of Records in Iacon. It is a private library, essentially, in the northern capital of Cybertron, the opposite side of the world to Megatron. He's been doing the same job for a long time because of the caste system of Cybertron, which permanently decides what social class someone has and what job they will do for the rest of their lives. Orion Pax basically listens to the news all day on their internet, monitoring communications on the communications grid, and categorizing it into files. Icon is a beautiful city with a lot of gold coloring, an aspiring place except Cybertronians don't generally dream anymore. The world is stagnant and has been at least for 1,000 years. The 13 Primes are just mythical now to them, for no one knows that Alpha Trion is one of them. Orion knows history well, but only believes in the more recent, recorded history of when Cybertron is a flourishing, expanding planet. Space bridges were portals that allowed Cybertronians to colonize uninhabited worlds, such as Velocitron. But now, the space bridges are crumbling in the sky. Orion Pax humbly accepts his job, but the news transmissions he is hearing from the South starts interesting him. There's a gladiator named Megatronus, which is a surprising name because it was one of the mythical 13 primes. Megatronus has never once lost a battle, and he was catching the attention of those not interested in the bloody fights. These battles are actually illegal, but they're so popular that these gladiatorial pits are tourist destinations, and their internet grid is buzzing with gladiatorial videos. This is the industry of Kaon and also Slaughter City. But the leaders controlling this tight world, the High Council, allow the arena battles because it entertains the oppressed population. It is a distraction. Then with the platform Megatronus has built, he starts discussing philosophy. Only through violence and risking his life to entertain the masses will they now listen to him. Reading this book makes you completely understand how Megatron became the way he did. So Ryan hears him talk in a video about how his body parts, his metal, is made of the same stuff of a High Council member. Basically, we all matter because we all bleed the same. Congratulations, that was the first five pages. See why this is a blink and you miss it book. So Ryan Pax is a bit nervous listening to Megatronus. He feels himself agreeing with his points and wonders if he would get in trouble if he didn't report the video. Yet he keeps watching as Megatronus says that the High Council is probably listening. And if he is eliminated, his lieutenant Soundwave and Shockwave will carry on his work. Ryan Pax is too timid to investigate since it is beyond his casserole, so he goes to speak to the overseer of the library, Alpha Trion, a very old bot. Alpha Trion is always writing in a book, although I'm not sure what material is made of. Orion does not know what it is for or what he writes. Orion has a lot of growing to do before he becomes the character we know, for he acts quite differently. Here he secretly thinks of Alpha Trion as an eccentric old bot. Orion may even become frustrated and speak out of turn a few times in this book, He's more like one of us, a shy individual struggling in life. So Alpha Trial listens to the recording, and Orion asks why Megatronus named himself after a mythical bot. Alpha Trion replies that Megatronus, the first, believed he would be vindicated by others on his path of doing what he thought was right. We will see that Megatron back then thought he was doing everything for the greater good, but his corruption comes from his want for vengeance. As someone who suffered so much for the entertainment of upper classes, Megatron does not care for their sparks. He's willing to kill and scare them for the rights of his own people. And that was chapter freaking one, a lot the process, let's go. The perspective switches to Albatron, and we learn of his book, The Covenant of Primus. He created this artifact after the War of the Primes, and it contains all past history up to Unicron and Primus, and even bits into the future, although they are hard to read. He's not sure what future will come true, but he's checking to see how he should deal with Megatrotus' uprising. Alpha Trion also has the Quill, the most powerful tool in the universe that has limited power to change the future with what it writes, but sometimes the alterations simply don't hold. The older portions of the book are written in archaic Cybertronian, dating only a few thousand years, so you see that they're not as old as other continuities. The future pages are also written in an obscure language difficult to read. Alpha Trion keeps his identity of an old Prime to himself, and he is quietly observed Cybertron developing. Now Cybertron has named a new Prime, but it does not mean he is very old or has any power. It is more of a special title. This is Sentinel Prime, and he has short-term goals. He thought that forming a caste system would be more productive for Cybertron. Sentinel Prime is called Zeta Prime in the War for Cybertron, but they are supposed to be the same bot, so his full name appears as Sentinel Zeta Prime in the Covenant of Primus to fix the problem. Sentinel rejected Alpha Trion's advice. 
seeing him as a mere old bot, and had dismissed him to the Hall of Records. The name Megatronus drowns Alvatrion in memories, and he goes to do research on our future Megatron. When Orion Pax comes to him, Alvatrion tells him what he learned. This factory worker and gladiator named Megatronus had not started forming a rebellion, but had slowly taken over the gangs who run the fight pits in Kaon and Slaughter City. Alvatrion then shows Orion the pics of the dead former gang leaders. There's even a clip of Megatronus, the first time Orion sees Megatronus, standing over a criminal leader he has killed. Megatronus tells the camera that it begins here, and describes that those who use them for entertainment and thrive off their labor have forgotten what it is to be Cybertronian. He talks about Cybertron falling and rising again, and he names himself Megatronus, the greatest prime in his opinion, because he refused to bow to others. Seeing this does not frighten Orion, but he does not know what to say. Alvatrion is pessimistic about Megatron's, oops, Megatronus's dreams, seeming to think that Cybertron will not be as good as it was before. Orion Pax is sent to his workstation to think about it all, the 18th floor with a window overlooking the city. Orion likes having a window and feels lucky for having one when other colleagues of his do not have one. Orion has difficulty concentrating because Alva Tryon made him imagine a world without cast. Orion knows Megatronus is a criminal and a killer of criminals, but his words just fill him with longing. Now we get Megatronus' perspective. Here is a gladiator pit, a huge expanse of metal ground, burning piles of scrap, blinding lights, and rows and rows of spectators. Many of the watchers are actually workers from Kaon themselves and the whole stadium makes so much noise that the gladiators have to turn off their audio receptors. Megatronus has a streak of over 100, and he is so good that this pit changed the rules for his opponents. They can enter first and try to hide among the scrap. Megatronus likes this because winning makes him look even more invincible. We get more information throughout the book about the meaning of his name and the name of the Decepticons. He thinks in this chapter of how his name strikes fear into the timid and loyalty into his followers. Megatronus sees his opponent hiding in body parts meant to be later smelted into something useful. You can definitely see the kind of environment he grew up in and understand why he is so desensitized to death and killing. Megatronus acts cocky for the audience's entertainment and to enrage his opponent into making a rash move. It is interesting how Megatronus caters to the audience, but inwardly hates how he is entertainment for them. He uses the audience to build his platform and spread his word. From the pile emerges a three-part combiner experiment, likely from Shockwave, he believes. He wins the fight with little injury, making a show of flinging things like an arm into the audience, even though it is dangerous for them. Other things we can note is that Megatronus has the philosophy of always finishing a kill before moving on, because a wounded enemy is still very much an enemy to him. That changes in the future when he grows arrogant. He also believes that he has no vulnerable parts. Combiners disgust him because he thinks they give up their identities in combining. He has his cannon and even maces, but Megatron transforms into a demolition tank, his natural form from creation. Covered in gore, he screams to the crowd about his might. They chant his name, and this is significant. The crowd shortens the name to make it end stronger, and Megatronus likes that ring. It gives him a burst of excitement. Megatron, because no Cybertronian has ever had that name. It will now be his alone. Megatron leaves the stadium thinking of how he will stop being a gladiator and become a leader of gladiators. He thinks of the old crime bosses who led the fights before he killed them, who wanted him to purposely lose non-fatal battles to better fill the stands. At that moment, he realized that he could either surrender control to someone else or fight to keep it. That was when he decided to fight, tearing the bosses and their bodyguards to pieces and taking over the arenas. Megatron arrives at the infirmary where Shockwave and Soundwave await him. Shockwave starts checking him over, and Megatron thinks of Shockwave as his mad scientist, but still someone with no ethical sense, and who is bound to betray him one day. Soundwave is different, completely loyal to the Rebellion, and very useful for a horde of minicons who work with him. At this time, three live attached to him, Laserbeak, Rumble, and Ravage. Soundwave is so skilled that Megatron nearly envies him, and they have met each other in a gladiatorial pit. A match to wound and not kill. He believes only Soundwave might have a chance of beating him. On the other hand, Megatron does not like or trust Minicons. At the end of this chapter, he tells them that he's Megatron now. They immediately accept it.
Back to Orion Pax, he's looking at the two moons and Triptychon Station floating in the sky. He thinks on what freedom is, as Megatron has said that freedom is every Cybertronian's right. Orion had been taught to believe that freedom and no cast would throw Cybertron into chaos, so he's nervous about the idea. That freedom was the choices you did within your cast, but unlimited choice would lead to the paralysis of confusion. But Orion questions who came up with this, Sentinel Prime. Orion climbs onto an observation deck and looks out over his city. He sees canyons in the far distance and the peaks of the Manganese Mountains, and then he looks at the amusement park, six lasers over Cybertron, and gets stirrings of anger. They rarely let lower cast members go in, and he never gone although he would love to. Then he questions if that is best for society, for the place would be so crowded if anyone could simply go in. The brainwashing confuses him so much that Orion decides to talk to an old friend of his at Macadam's old oil house bar, Jazz. Jazz is above him in cast rank, a cultural investigator who sometimes came into the Hall of Records for work, and that is how they met. Jazz suggests that they go to Kaon and see the fights themselves. Mika Ryan thinks that is a bad idea, since it is illegal and he can't get away with too much. Jazz says that they can claim it is a cultural investigation and go. Our Optimus is drinking an alcohol called Visco with Jazz as he speaks. He, he realizes that he has hardly been anywhere else on Cybertron, nowhere near Kaon before, although he spends all day listening to broadcasts from everywhere. Orion also starts feeling kinship to the workers, thinking they're not so different. Jazz laughs and says that they are different because Orion's work would not kill him, and no one would melt his body into products when he died. Orion is shocked, but Jazz has pointed out that he should feel more fortunate for what he has. Orion then thinks that he should go and actually meet Megatron, calling him interesting. All the possibilities get him going. He admits that he had been overstepping the boundaries of his cast, rooting around in the historical archives. Jazz warns him that he should not do this, but Orion bursts out that how can he not when he has a mind and can think and analyze. Now he has set his mind on talking with Megatron. Orion secretly sends out a message for Megatron, saying that what you say is interesting, but more people are hearing than you think. Let's speak. While well, he adds contact information for a private conversation. He stays late at work, waiting for an answer, then later tells Jazz that Megatron answered him. He had said, you are more right than you know. I am also more right than you know. Before agreeing to meet, Jazz warns him that he could get in serious trouble, but Orion is committed. We learn that Alva Trion is completely aware and has read the private text conversation between the two. Orion tells Megatron about his job and the limits they put on him. Megatron encourages him to be an individual and challenge the rules, but he also tells him that many would love to live in Iacon. So if Orion is still unhappy in Iacon, what does that tell him about the system? Megatron tells him that he also cannot understand how bad it is in himself, so Orion starts to see him as his mentor. He asks Megatron to help him understand everything. Megatron is interested in Orion as someone who can tailor his message and spread it among other higher castes. Alva Trion is apprehensive, but he knows that great change will come to Cybertron that cannot be stopped. Orion keeps having private philosophical discussions with Megatron and has started having video calls. Orion is hearing more about individuality, and Megatron says that these conversations are helping him learn as well, keeping him sharp. One thing he could not get out of Megatron was what he was going to do next of his ideas. Megatron hides the answer, saying that his associates are thinking about it. It makes Orion nervous, and Jazz warns him to be wary of Megatron's sketchy figure, that Orion might be influenced into breaking laws. Still, Orion openly voices his concern to Megatron, and Megatron challenges the concept of laws, saying that they were made without their consultation. Back to Jazz, who seems to be a supporter of the current system, tells him that there would be chaos if rebellions were started every time they were left out of a lawmaking process. But this brainwashing is being lost on Orion, and he's inclining toward Megatron now. Orion hasn't met Megatron in person yet, although Megatron says that he cannot understand Cybertron until he has seen Kaon. Orion counters that Megatron must too see Iacon to understand Cybertron. A bit ominous, Megatron says, Oh, I will see Iacon. Have no fear of that. Orion doesn't want to upset Megatron because he feels like they have some things in common. Orion asks him about his name again, which Megatron is always describing in more and more detail. He talks about how only the Fallen is considered Fallen, although all the mythical primes fell from their ideals. The principle of freedom, which Megatron believes in, has fallen. And this quote is significant. He says, History makes some boss villains for doing what they thought was right, 
If that happens to me as well, so be it. I can only do what is the right thing to do. Shockwave and Soundwave are in the background of the video, and Orion thinks of how the roles are reversed, that although these different cast members are working together, the gladiator is the one in charge here. Note also that mini-cons make Orion nervous. He has no trust of them either. Megatron also tells him that where he lives, you have to commit and never second-guess yourself or else you die. Orion asks him specific questions, but Megatron does not distrust him and gives some answers. He admits that Soundwave does not trust Orion and warns him. Megatron jokes that if he did not trust Orion, he would fight him in a pit. Megatron reveals that he has followers across many Sylvan regions, enough to take over the Hydrax spaceport at any time he desires. Megatron still would like to meet him since they have merely been having friendly conversations otherwise. Those words make Orion realize that he has become friends with a revolutionist and criminal. Jazz is still a bit judgmental, telling Orion that Megatron has a shady past, but Orion defends him since he already knew of it. He tells Jazz that Megatron joked about fighting him, but Jazz thinks Megatron would only joke if he half thought it might happen. Orion laughs, but then thinks this is a good idea to learn basic self-defense, just in case. He practices fighting with Jazz every other day, learning how to produce his body's natural weapons as well. Orion finds this fun, and after experiencing some fun, he finds it harder to go back to his boring work. Also during practice, he can't help but think of Megatron and the other Cybertronians who have to fight for their own lives. Very carefully, Orion has started spreading messages of his support of Megatron's ideas. And while Orion is friends with Megatron, he has grown enough to realize that their ideas in changing Cybertron are different. Orion thinks he is much more patient, he believes that change will happen through political means. When they attract so much attention and support that Sentinel Prime and the High Council will have to do something. And now, Orion Pact is finding himself becoming known for some bots are mentioning him before Megatron sometimes. Orion messages Alpha Trion for some time off work, intending at last to visit Megatron. Alpha Trion wants to speak to him in person, but Orion ignores the message because he does not want Alpha Trion to talk him out of it. Orion Pax drives from Iacon the Kaon, passing Kallus near the Well of All Sparks, and continuing southward. He watches the smoothness he knows turn into ragged landscapes as he passes through the Taurus States, the Sea of Rust, around the Sonic Canyons, and through the Badlands. He sees Kaon and it is a horrible place to live. The large city sits under a heavy cloud of pollution, making it difficult to see. The place is a tangle of blackened metal and rust, and because of low visibility, Orion transforms to protoform, bot form, and carefully moves on. He thinks the place looks like it had been bombed from orbit and put together by blind minicons, and he imagines what it would have been like to have lived here since one's creation. Orion heads towards a building Megatron has described, a black pyramid-shaped one where gladiatorial fights and black market trades for optics and auditory components take place since those become damaged easily in the pollution and fights in Kaon. Here is the heart of the fights, although there are dozens of fight pits in other districts. This is where champions all come. And now that Megatron has taken over, he is turning it into the heart of his army. Orion is stopped by two guards, Barricade and Massive Lugnut. There is some trouble since they claim they didn't hear Megatron was expecting anyone. In the end, Barricade fetches Megatron, who shakes hands with Orion and makes a joke. He calls Orion his friend, and Orion is happy since he could only think of Jazz as a friend before, and some former classmates he had long forgotten now. Just this line tells us that for some Cybertronians, they had a brief education, although likely with a lot of brainwashing. Megatron starts giving Orion a tour of the building, and even points out an aerial tournament arena separate from the ground fight ones. Megatron talks about how Barricade runs the daily tasks while Shockwave keeps the gladiators fixed and healthy. They hear a skittering minicon spying on them, and Megatron laughs that Soundwave shows his loyalty by spying on everyone, even him. They also see a level of bots being trained in martial arts, and another workshop developing armor and weapons. Orion is a bit excited, but he tells Megatron that he doesn't think armed rebellion is necessary. He thinks they have to keep spreading the word of freedom until Sentinel Prime and the High Council make a change. Megatron and Orion bicker, with Megatron claiming that those in Iacon see it that way, that reading will solve their problems while Orion counters that a gladiator would only see fighting as the way to solve the problems. Then Barricade intervenes, threatening Orion to agree with the boss, but Megatron cools him and insists that Orion is a scholar and a friend, not someone to intimidate. Yet Megatron insists that talk is not going anywhere, so he has sent bots to scour the planet for artifacts of the Primes, 
which implies that he might believe in them but not the Primes themselves. Megatron also tells Orion that some bots are being influenced by his words, and they might take action without his order. To that, Orion says they need to distance themselves from the extremists, or else their names will be slandered by them. Orion feels in his spark that one day he will have to be firm about his beliefs, but not here on Megatron's turf around bots who hardly know him. Megatron asks him if he is with him, and Orion says, I am with your ideas, they are my ideas as well. So in front of an audience of real brutish bots, Megatron cries out that Orion is his friend and part of the rebellion. After that, Megatron says that they'll need a name for it. Orion has been thinking of this and he suggests Autobots, for to seek autonomy. Megatron replies that he too has been thinking of a name, but Shockwave arrives before he can reveal it. This chapter begins with a string of terrorist bomb attacks at the Amusement Park 6 lasers over Cybertron and the regions Urea, Polyhex, Stanix, Blaster City, and a few sites in the Sonic Canyons. High Counselor Halogen speaks of the events, blaming Megatron, a criminal, gang leader, and underground gladiator for these attacks. Halogen is mentioned by Smokescreen and Prime. He's the oldest serving High Counselor, but he is greedy about expanding his land claims, so Cybertronians tend not to listen to him, thinking that it's all part of his own agenda. Now Blaster City is part of the oppressed South, but what was blown up was an important factory supplying munitions to Cybertron's council militias. No one knows how many factory workers died though, since sparks are said to be cheap in Blaster City, so no one keeps track. Orion is still with Megatron when this happens, looking at their communication technology. That is when they hear of the attacks together when the internet grid shows reports of the bombings. But some really weird error happens in this book where Megatron, for some reason, asks Orion if he is an icon. Megatron wants to address Cybertron about the bombings, to tell them that this is not how their movement will operate. Orion gives him a channel where he tells the world that he had nothing to do with the bombings, although he cannot deny that the perpetrators had been influenced by his ideals. Megatron says that he pities the loss of life, but takes the moment to critique those Cybertronians who had taken pleasure in watching gladiators die. He claims that these terrorists are telling them that they are reclaiming their lives. The book then explains the bombing of the Sonic Canyons, how legend says that the computer, Vector Sigma, might be located there. It seems that someone either wanted it destroyed or were trying to gain access to it, but the general public is highly offended, thinking of this area as sacred ground important to Cybertron. They slander Megatron, and Orion cannot take it so now he opens a channel for himself, announcing to the world who he is, and also defending Megatron against the accusations that he is responsible for the bombings. Orion is back with Megatron when doing this, so we just have to throw away that Iacon mistake and keep him in Kaon. Soundwave and Shockwave are behind him, not seeming thrilled in this data clerk taking such a large role, but Orion is seen as a co-leader in this revolution. The grid immediately starts tearing Orion apart, calling him a terrorist and crackpot. Now we get a better description of the bombing of the amusement park. 36 minicons carry bombs to the most popular roller coaster, the plasma curve. No one notices them as they wait in line and think about the turns on the fast ride. The Minicons suicide bomb the coaster, and as the coaster tears apart, the riders fatally crash and the frames crush everyone who had been waiting in line. Orion is upset about everything and wants to return to Iacon. Megatron doesn't want him to leave angry, and the way he speaks of him makes it hard for Orion to argue with anything. Orion notes that Megatron had an orator's gift, who had been practicing his whole life in rousing crowds. If he wants to learn to speak without getting spoken over, Orion is going to have to learn the skills so that he can spread his own ideals. We are sent to another location on Cybertron, a settlement in Polyhex beside Dark Mount, an ancient fortress next to some large natural smelting pools. The fact that this all appears in Transformers Prime impresses me. Someone did their research. Some houses beside a valley are owned by art lovers, rich members of society who live in remote areas and fly from party to party. Someone must have really hated them because they set off a bomb on the cliffside that carries some houses right into a smelting pit. Few die, but they are members of the high cast, such as Chromatron, an artist who had just been making a model of Megatron's face. After Ryan has left him, Megatron sighs to himself that he not wanted this. It seems to be said not about the attacks, but because he had not wanted Ryan to be upset with him. Megatron claims that the world looks different from the pits that it does in the Hall of Records. The next bombing location area we get information on is Fort Sick? Psych? Let's go with Psych overlooking the city of Stanix. Fort Psych is basically a military or police academy, training council militia and local law units. 
The bomb destroys the headquarters of the militia magistrate Gauntlet, who had believed in the caste system and had never considered a life outside of his military caste. He had looked forward to the High Council and wanting to crush Megatron's rebellion because he had wanted to take part in it. Minicon had placed the bomb in the parade ground and also killed 183 others. Alpha Trion watches these videos of destruction and is horrified. He gets flashbacks to the war fought among the Primes. And then he sees a video of bodies and wreckage in Eurea, with an anonymous voice speaking over it. On behalf of the low cast, the forgotten, the downtrodden, we now tread on you. When Orion gets back to Iacon, he hurries to Alpha Trion for advice. Alpha Trion thinks that war cannot be prevented and that Orion has placed himself into the middle of it. Alpha Trion reveals that he always knew that Orion had been privately speaking with Megatron, but he asks Orion about his impressions of Megatron. Alpha Trion then says that Megatron truly believes in his ideals, but ultimately, his methods are going to undermine them. Both do not think Megatron actually ordered these bombs, but Alpha Trion is sure that Megatron's ego is going to change. When Orion leaves the room, he is surprised to find Shockwave there waiting for him. Mind you, there are no ground bridges, so Shockwave had to come all that way. Shockwave asks for a tour of Iacon, but Orion feels strongly that there is no choice. Shockwave shows him a location on the map, and Orion recognizes it. It's one of his favorite places to go, the observatory. Inside, Megatron is waiting in the shadows. Orion is both nervous but angry, and he tells Megatron that things are getting out of control. Megatron replies that these kind of things cannot be controlled, and he reveals that he heard these attacks were going to happen, but did not try to stop them. Orion is horrified, and he cries out he had defended him. Megatron argues with him, telling him that he does not want death, but it's going to happen and the extremists make them look more credible in comparison. He tells Orion that he needs to learn the hard truth of things. And then Megatron leads Orion through Iacon. This scene is so short, but man, it's my favorite twist in the whole book. Orion is shocked when he suddenly finds himself in a gladiatorial arena underneath Iacon, his own city. The stands are filled with roaring middle-class Iaconians watching bots fight to the death. And there, cheering in the audience, is Orion's friend Jazz. I absolutely love this. See, a lot of people who do not know the lore about the caste system and the gladiatorial fights always talk smack about the Decepticons. They will say that Decepticons are horrible war criminals who killed thousands of innocents. But this right here shows us the Decepticon perspective. These bots are not innocent civilians. They are watching slaves die for their entertainment. To the Decepticons, these bots are the original evil and they are the ones fighting for justice. Jazz had been discouraging Orion and supporting the caste system. Autobot Jazz had rejected the freedom bots, thinking it would lead to chaos, while he lived off the labor of others and enjoyed blood sports. I hope you now see why the Decepticons hold so much hatred for the Autobots, why they want to bomb amusement park goers and your average civilian. And you can see why the low caste wants to take over for themselves, for it would be unbearable for them to let the rich change the rules, improve their lives, but never suffer for the past wrongs. Megatron's people are definitely tortured souls who want revenge to heal themselves, and this is why his movement turns to violence. And the Autobots you will see do not want violence, but change for the words. Because violence would of course mean death to themselves. Decepticons would be infuriated by that, being called the brutish lot while these civilians have hurt them so much before hiding away and crying out for peace. This logic is how you get loyal soldiers like Dreadwing and Soundwave, who had not been slaves but completely see the Decepticon cause as just, and that the Autobot resistance has extended the fighting and caused lost lives. Now let's return to the scene of the Pit and Iacon. Hologram screens are being projected all over the arena, but suddenly these images show fire and destruction, and everyone goes quiet in confusion. They see a factory explode, police fighting firing bots, and someone whispers that this is Altahex. Megatron turns to Orion, stating that it looks like civil war. Orion turns on him, accusing him of sounding happy, but Megatron points out that he understands death better than he does, that he can mourn death while Orion can only be shocked by it. Orion realizes that this is true, that he struggles to feel emotionally for bots dying on the screen. Megatron says that they should go to Altahex, but not to join the fight, but to look for the Matrix of Leadership. Altahex is supposedly the last known location of the artifact because Sentinel was there. We are taken to a casino on Altahex before the fighting breaks out. From the perspective of a comedian, we meet Armorhide, a member of the artist cast. Comedy is his chosen art, and he has found an audience in the floating space station of Altahex. 
At the Aldehex Casino, he is telling a failing joke, which frustrates him because tonight of all nights, Sentinel Prime is in his audience. But then Sentinel Prime, Keeper of the Cast, Marshal of the Armies of Cybertron, who is rumored to carry the Matrix, laughs at his joke. And just then, the wall blew apart. And here we go, mates, it's Starscream. Starscream is at the casino when the attacks start. He had been tasked to be Sentinel Prime's bodyguard, and the sound of the explosion causes him to transform reflexively. Then he pulls Sentinel Prime away from a collapsing column. They hear an announcement that the Decepticons are taking Alta Hex in the name of Megatron, and Starscream tries to advise Sentinel Prime before suddenly attackers burst inside. Note that some of them are seekers, not just low caste slaves. Sentinel cries out that he will fight, but then he starts getting blasted in the chest. Starscream fires back, protecting Sentinel till he gets back to his feet. But when Starscream glances back at him, he sees fear on Sentinel's face. This surprises Starscream, who is not concerned about the attack and thinks it is only a small one. He holds onto Sentinel and retreats with him, telling him he will protect him, although contemptuous thoughts start to run through Starscream's head. Suddenly, hatred for Sentinel Prime has entered his spark. He brings Sentinel to Skywarp and Thundercracker telling him that his trusted lieutenants will protect him. Sentinel tells Starscream to go on and get help and tell everyone the truth of what happened at the casino. Starscream goes back to the fighting, but his mind is occupied. He thinks of how dishonorable Sentinel was, someone who had once been a great leader, now a coward who had made Cybertron into a decaying world. Starscream thinks it's time for a new leadership that would rebuild Cybertron. He apparently has ordered Skywarp and Thundercracker to take Sentinel Prime and lock him away deep in Kaon where no one would find him. But they already know what to do. Hardly anyone is left in the casino's main hall, but the comedian is there firing at random targets. The comedian starts shooting at Starscream, but Starscream does not have time or desire to fight, so he blasts off to a meeting he apparently does not want to be late for. For some reason we are treated again of the perspective of the comedian. He is personally offended that Alda Hex is being attacked, and he watches Sentinel get escorted out by Starscream, who Armor Hyde saw as a menacing guard who not laughed at a single one of his jokes. I think we can now see why he wanted to shoot Starscream. And now, we follow Starscream to his meeting. He flies to the Badlands, and there he meets Megatron for the first time face to face. Megatron congratulates him on playing his part perfectly, and now we know that Starscream is deeper into the rebellion than we thought. Starscream had been tasked to take Sentinel out of the picture, but he'd only gained true disgust for Sentinel once he witnessed him reacting to the attack. Starscream tells Megatron that it had been an easy job, since he had been close as a protector of the Sentinel Prime for a long time, so he had trusted him. Seekers have not been mentioned yet, so now we start to wonder what they have been doing, and why would they support the Rebellion. They can't see Alta Hex from the Badlands, but Starscream looks at the sky and dreams about leading Cybertronians out into space again. He thinks that perhaps leading the Decepticons would be the first step towards that. For now, he thinks being on good terms with Megatron and doing him a favor will give him bargaining power. Megatron notices him looking at the sky and tells him that he will write history, so he asks Starscream what part does he want to play in the rebellion. It's very clear that Starscream is not afraid of him, and tells Megatron that he cannot threaten him. He says that Megatron will never be able to win the war without the military strength of his seekers. Megatron acknowledges the standoff, knowing that he cannot push Starscream. He tells him to think about it and make a choice, but Megatron's next offer may not be the same. So you know how different Orion is to Optimus Prime and Starscream while he still had his lieutenants behaves so differently with Megatron. He is the sassiest little thing and I think I need to dedicate a video to all the times Starscream just didn't give a damn. Somewhere in the second novel, he just straight up refuses one of Megatron's orders and Mach salutes him. Here he just ignores everything Megatron said and is like, yeah well, I'm going to hang out on Trypticon Station. Megatron asks him why he would do that, and Starscream is delighted to know something that Megatron doesn't. He tells Megatron, oh you know, something dangerous I want to protect from falling into the wrong hands. Megatron is offended that he is implying his hands are the wrong ones, but Starscream shrugs it off and says that Cybertron needs change, not annihilation. Megatron is vexed, he wants to fight Starscream but knows he can't, he asks him plainly, Starscream, are you with us? Starscream says he's not against him, but he can't say anything more than that when the High Council might be monitoring him. Megatron believes that the High Council would not imagine a lowly gladiator like him having enough ambition to work with Starscream. Hearing him speak like that, Starscream tells him not to hold a grudge because he needs a clear head and will be working with bots outside of the low casts. Megatron threatens him one more time before driving away, 
and Starscream immediately sends a message to his closest seekers to meet him at Trypticon. Megatron intercepts the message so he knows what Starscream has commanded, but he has no idea why Starscream is so concerned about the semi-sentient junk in space. The dead of the attacks are being counted. At this time, Orion meets with Alpha Trion again. Alpha Trion thinks that since Megatron has had a taste of armed combat, he'll start to like it. He also points out that the gladiator pits have shut down, and all the fighters want to join these so-called Decepticons. Alpha Trion asks Orion if he thinks Megatron planned the casino attack, and Orion starts to think it's not impossible since he knows that Megatron is quick to anger. He thinks that perhaps he's a violent bot. He wonders if Megatron joined the pit fights because of that, or if the pits made him this way. Orion decides that the reason does not matter. Alpha Trion then lets Orion know that he knows Megatron better than anyone in Iacon. If he were to advise the High Council, what would he say? It then sparks an idea in Orion. He suggests that both he and Megatron speak to the High Council, so that they can hear Megatron's grievances while Orion acts as the go-between to better explain the situation. Alpha Trion pauses to think, and we get a quick sentence, a blink and you miss it one, where we hear Seekers flying overhead, off a scheduled flight path. The Air Command is starting to act strange, but no one notices it. Alpha Trion points out that the High Council schedules times to hear from certain casts at certain times. Orion Pack snaps that it's ridiculous to wait after Sentinel Prime's disappearance and all the attacks. Alpha Trion replies that he never supported the caste system when it was made, but if Orion wants to get anywhere with the Council, he has to play by their rules. Alpha Trion promises to speak to them about the idea. And Ryan Pax leaves wondering just how old Alpha Trion is. He suddenly wonders if he could be one of the 13, then he brushes off that idea, thinking that they're all dead or mythical. Ryan decides to meet Megatron at an unused part of the Hydrax spaceport. Once it had been a busy place where alien species traded goods, but now it is dilapidated, only used to send supplies to the moons and Trypticon station. Orion wants to talk about how the casino attack makes him look bad, but Megatron points out that all Cybertron can talk about these days is casts. Orion sarcastically replies that millions of Cybertronians are talking about it, mainly how they want Megatron's head. They are arguing and Orion feels that Megatron is testing him, seeing how far they can go about breaking their friendship. But Megatron and Orion stay on good terms, moving forward because there is no going back. Megatron says that they need to figure out what is on Trypticon, and it seems that Megatron has already mentioned Starscream to Orion. Orion is not impressed by Starscream, waving him off as a mere seeker air officer who doesn't know anything important. Orion tells Megatron that they have a spot and will meet the High Council soon, and in the meantime, Orion thinks to himself that he could do a bit of research about Trypticon. But again, he does not take Starscream seriously. He wonders if Starscream is bluffing to gain an important role in the Rebellion or to arrest Megatron and Orion if they try to go to Trypticon, looking for the secret. Megatron continues on, claiming the importance of voicing their arguments to the High Council. He does not want anarchy, but nothing has changed in the system since he and Orion first started having their video chats. Now, they will have a supporting audience in the Grand Conference Chamber. Orion mentions that they got much more attention from the dead from the casino and amusement park bombing, and Megatron thinks it was a sacrifice that will help prevent a civil war. Orion points out that their ideals are about self-determination, and these dead did not choose to die for this cause. Megatron states that he makes a good point, and this is why it's good that he is his friend. He keeps him conscious of things that are easy to forget. Welcome to Crystal City, a beautiful, glimmering place that is so shiny that its glow can be seen over the horizon from Iacon. It is the center of art and science, and Soundwave hates the place. It reeks of self-indulgence. He has four Minicons attached to him now, and he ejects Rumble and Frenzy from his body, announcing Operation Matrix Quest. Soundwave has not taken his vow yet, and he still talks in all three novels, just not very often. The Minicons chirp back at him in code. They can speak, but want to be swift in missions. He lets them go inside while he waits, and Soundwave decides against sending in Laser Beacon Ravage because he thinks the more he sends in, the more likely it is he will lose one of them. Going after the deepest secret of Crystal City, he might lose one today. It is said that Starscream, who has spent much of his scientific career in these labs, did not know these secrets. You may know of the issue regarding whether Starscream is a scientist or not, since later in the book, he does not understand something because he is not a scientist. Now Starscream is a military commander, but as someone of a higher caste, one can assume that he has education in various subjects. You will see Seekers later who specialize in engineering, not combat. 
Starstream does show himself to have basic knowledge of science, so the best way to resolve this issue might be to believe that Starstream has come here before and has some experience in labs, but it is not his specialty. Sawai thinks that no one knows all the deeper secrets except maybe Omega Supreme. Omega Supreme is a dormant titan whose missile defenses he is afraid of activating. Soundwave is actually afraid of ever awakening this titan's power even for the liberty of Cybertron. And it is revealed that he has Megatron convinced of his loyalty, but Soundwave is still waiting to see who will come out on top, the Rebellion or the High Council. Soundwave's skills are valuable to whoever will run the future. Soundwave is also suspicious of Orion Pax, thinking that Megatron is underestimating him. He checks on his Minicons, who have not set off the defense systems. Soundwave wonders if the secret is even still there or even worth it, for he's not a superstitious bot and does not think relics would improve a leader's quality. Then Soundwave thinks that if the Matrix were here, the foolish scientists would be misusing it. He scorns them, thinking how useless they are when the space bridges are rotting in the sky. Soundwave is willing to be Megatron's spymaster. He takes pleasure in compiling knowledge, especially damaging knowledge. But one of his worries is that inevitably, the employers of spymasters start wanting more information about their spymasters and send spies to spy on them. Soundwave does not want rivals. You can see Soundwave's mind is wandering a lot as he awaits. He thinks about the underground, how in the past, Cybertronians fresh from the well had to make a traditional run from the well to Crystal City. Since they have stopped the practice, Soundwave thinks society has gotten softer. He believes that Cybertronians who survived that run would be ready for more. Now, there are warning signs for no one knew what creatures now resided in those tunnels. Soundwave hopes that Megatron will restore the swashbuckling spirit of Cybertron. The Minicons find a transmission of the scientists talking about waking Omega Supreme to stop Megatron. Spooked, Soundwave calls back his Minicons and leaves, and wonders if he should be a revolutionary anymore. Meanwhile, Orion Pax researches Trypticon. Apparently, the station had recently been recreated and given a spark. He searches to see what is on Trypticon, but he finds dead ends and blocks in security. He takes the question to Alpha Trion, who might have security clearance as well. Alpha Trion does not know what is hidden on Trypticon, since the old High Counselors hid a secret there. The station was given life to protect the secret, and now only Sentinel Prime knows what the Seekers are guarding. So then Alpha Trion suggests that Orion ask the Seekers. But Orion does not know any Seekers, they have always been distant, flying overhead. He knows very little about them, except that some are designed for sky and some for space and that Starscream is one of their leaders. Orion does not know how to contact Starscream or how to convince him to even answer his question. Now it's time to get ready for the meeting with the High Council. He looks back to his workstation, wondering if this will be the last time he works there. At last, it is time. Megatron is not excited like Orion thought he would be, but satisfied. He says that he got the opportunity because of his cast, and they would not have even been so open if Megatron had asked. Orion informs him that he can't show up just to air his grievances, he has to plan a way forward. Megatron says he's just a gladiator and that's how he knows to speak. But Orion jests that it's been a long time since he has been a gladiator. Now he has to act like the legitimate leader, or else the council will shut him down. Megatron thanks him for the advice and he counts on Orion to speak for him and about what they both believe in. The room is massive and shaped like an idealized spark. The 13 High Council members are at the podiums, each with gavels to take their turns. On the floor are rows of seats for spectators, packed now with bots from Minicons to large bots of the Lightning Strike Coalition, which we'll later see being turned into the Dinobots. The pro and anti-reform spectators have been segregated. Halogen is the moderator of the meeting, which is good since he is the oldest High Counselor who had lived before the cast and might be open about changing the system. Alpha Trion is not present, but Orion thinks how this could not have happened without him. Halogen begins, listing the two main topics of the today, deciding who will be responsible for the attacks and what to do about the caste system. He describes it in a way that Megatron is already being branded as someone violent who broke the peaceful lives of Cybertronians, and Halogen goes on to say that the caste system was instituted legally. He then makes a big deal about Sentinel Prime's absence, to which the tiny Minicon counselor Ratbat agrees to. Ratbat is known to be a corrupt counselor who only cares about money, and throughout the meeting he will call out jokes and try to discourage Orion in particular. Halogen calls for order and continues. He says that the rumors have it that Megatron has cooperated with the Seekers commander Starscream, and they are responsible for Sentinel Prime's disappearance. 
and this will be addressed, although Starscream is currently out in space. They call Megatron to the stand, and he walks out from the shadows. The Council stare at him for a while, before the Seeker High Counselor, Contrail, asks him to confirm his identity. Megatron does, and Contrail challenges him, asking him by whose authority does he have the right to his name. Megatron answers his own authority, a scandalous answer that causes a stir. Contrail says that names can only be given at creation, but Megatron, of course, does not see that tradition as the only way. Ratbat presses them to change topics, and Contrail tells Megatron he must be truthful and complete. To that, Megatron says that he will tell only complete truths, although the High Counselors will not like them. He throws out another scandalous reply, that the High Council prefers obeisance instead of an interchange of equals. It is always clear in Megatron's words that he holds contempt for them in his spark. Now that Megatron's identity is confirmed, they decide to go straight to his testimony. Megatron's speech goes before Orion's. He starts with his backstory, that he had been a slave with no name, simply called D-16 based on the section of the mine he did demolition work in. And the first time he saw a gladiator match, he realized how his life and the lives of the lower castes meant nothing to those of the higher castes. As he speaks of that feeling of worthlessness, Megatron's voice becomes thunderous. He becomes quieter after the tap of Halogen's gavel, as he explains that they decided they had worth. They who died in the factories producing goods that were taken for granted. And in fighting one another in the pits, they realized they were individuals, understanding life when they killed. After he finishes speaking, the first question he gets is if he is connected to the bombing of the amusement park and other locations. Funnily enough, Six Lasers over Cybertron is the first location on Contrail's mind. Megatron denies having ordered it, again saying that some bots influenced by his words have acted beyond his control. Another counselor is introduced around here, Drivetrain, who had once been a Constructicon middle class long ago but had wormed his way into their favor. Drivetrain says that if Megatron is denying having kidnapped Sentinel Prime, are they to expect that the data clerk made the plan and organized a band of Decepticons? Megatron pretends to have only heard that term for the first time, but Drivetrain accuses him of coining it. Megatron tells them that if this is the name they place upon him, then he will accept it, for sometimes deception is necessary before others can see the truth. Council asks Sigil to speak. Sigil, is that- that's how you say it, right? Representative of the guilds, the bots who organize the castes. They claim that the castes have served Cybertron well, guiding their decisions in the right direction. He slanders Megatron again as an unruly criminal that should not be listened to. After speaking, the council now addresses Orion who has not yet had a chance to speak. The first thing he does is bash Sigil, calling him a pompous bot who is ignoring the unhappiness of others. Orion walks through the aisle as he speaks and comes closer to the council members. Orion immediately starts to rebuke Sigil's words, questioning if this is what the 13 Primes would have wanted. He points out that when the caste systems were being established, Cybertron lost its reach across the universe in contact with his colonies. And as they confined each individual into a smaller and smaller life, they have taken away their ability to look beyond and imagine. Ratbat makes a dumb joke, causing laughter, but Ryan sees Jazz encouraging him in the seats, so he stays strong. He begins an unplanned speech right then, not knowing where it will lead. He defends Megatron saying that he speaks harshly, but true, that he is angry because of the spark-deep pain of the life he has lived. Orion condemns the bombings, but he claims that they are symptoms of a bound society. A spark is born knowing it is free, a Cybertronian changes from one form to another, and would also need the freedom to change their roles in a society. The castes go against Cybertronian nature, and a world without change is not stable, it is entropic, only dead things stay the same. It does not matter what kind of Cybertronian one is, all of a spark is alive with the idea to choose what it will become. No one else can decide for it. Orion brings up the Quintesson invasion and how during that time, all bots of all occupations banded together to drive away their invaders. And Sentinel Prime had been a mere member of the League Guard who had risen to someone greater. Furthermore, these Quintessons had wanted to enslave them. And just after they have been sent away, Cybertronians are now enslaving each other. Here they are crushing this movement for freedom, in the name of order. But order obtained through force can never be peaceful. There is no peace through tyranny. 
Orion continues on to say that they should name a new Prime who will not treat Cybertronians like cogs in a machine like Sentinel has. They'll need a leader who will treat everyone like autonomous robots owned by no one. Orion says that this day and moment should be remembered as when free robots broke the wells of oppression that had taken the beauty of the spark away from us. He says that if the movement requires a name, let it thus be Autobots. Orion's speech is so powerful that everyone is silent for so long. He then breaks the silence by crying out, Autobots! And the room echoes with many voices joining in. Then he turns to Megatron, expecting approval, but instead he sees anger. Haldin puts blame on Orion and Megatron for the adoption of the Sentinel Prime, whether they commanded it or not. However, Haldin begins to take blame as well for not having responded to the pent-up anger. Immediately, Ratbat protests, hoping Haldin is not thinking of upending the caste system that has been serving them all so well. Haldin claims that it has already been upended. Halogen is now fixed, stating that they have been willfully blind for so long. Then they come to the topic of the Matrix, and the attempts to accept their concept may locate it. However, the Matrix is said to only appear to those worthy of it. The Council admits that they do not know where it is, but the one who will carry it will lead Cybertron to a new age. And then Halogen points to Orion and decrees that he will take the quest to find the Matrix. Orion is so shocked that he asks, Excuse me? While well, Megatron is deftly still beside him. But then, Halogen announces that from here on out, Orion shall be Optimus Prime, the one who will unite Cybertron. Orion takes time to accept this, the book still refers to him as Orion until he dies. The room is split by reactions. Orion's supporters and colleagues cheer. The Guild Masters protest how the Council put this responsibility on a mere data clerk, and Megatron's followers are outraged that Orion is getting the sort of coronation. Orion realizes he cannot refuse, and now he has become Optimus Prime. Optimus comes up to the stand and claims that he is not worthy, and Megatron cries out sarcastically, a fine show of humility. He then takes over, fuming mad in a feeling of betrayal. He accuses Optimus of pretending to have come as a friend and peacemaker, when what he truly wanted was power. Optimus still denies this and wishes for Megatron to believe him, but he does not. He cries out to his followers in his rage, insulting the fact that the Council made a data clerk the next Prime. Optimus tries to calm him, but Megatron announces that they are brothers no more. He continues to declare that his caste has fought against the militia for their freedom, and now the Council has chosen an autocrat to protect their own interests, leaving the low caste to rot in the pits. Megatron and his followers are getting quite riled up in the belief that they are going to be controlled. And when Optimus says that he does not want to control him, they scream that he's lying. Optimus claims that he will lead and work with Megatron to change what needs to be changed. Megatron is having none of it. He is upset because he was the one who discovered the ideal of freedom. He had educated Orion, but the High Council has chosen him. Megatron then proclaims that he will lead the Decepticons and fight for the freedom of all Cybertronians. Halogen commands Megatron to respect the Prime, and in wrath, Megatron turns and fires at Halogen, killing him. The Elite Guard rushes for Megatron, and Megatron's followers expose their weapons. The Autobot synthesizers point their weapons at them, and is a standoff until Optimus orders that they let the Decepticons leave. More bots than Optimus expected leave of Megatron, and to his surprise, Contrail carrying Ratbat in his cockpit follow Megatron. We have an excerpt from the Covenant of Primus written by Alpha Trion on the Civil War. Alpha Trion laments all that has happened since the Golden Age, and he talks about the qualities in Orion that had made him want to tell the Council to make him the next Prime. The Covenant of Primus has foretold that a new Prime would come, one who would fight the forces that defied Cybertron. He starts to describe a stream of events that have occurred since the split in the High Council Chamber. The many Decepticons have spread across a large part of Cybertron, and Megatron took his first battle to the military post Fort Psyche. He attacks it with the aid of a formation of Seekers, although they have some trouble destroying the gates. At the same time, Decepticons take over Fort and Stanix. Then a missile launch from space takes out the gate, and Alvatron realizes that it must have been Starscream, who although not present, has participated in the battle. The gladiators burst in and absolutely annihilate the garrison, who cried for Optimus' help, only for none to come. Optimus learns the hard lesson that he has to let others die because he is unable to help them, and in the meantime, his time is best organizing his existing forces and converting neutral bots. Optimus brings a sorrow to Jazz, who tells him that he cannot mourn every soldier because he could never bear it. 
Optimus vows that he will mourn every lost life, and that is what separates him from Megatron. Everyone wants control of the spaceport, the Hydrax Plateau, and each side gives it their all. The Autobots now have Ultra Magnus, who had been Sergeant of the Council Guardians. He is a terror on the battlefield, smashing everyone with his favorite weapon, a hammer. This battle is also Optimus's first. Optimus's first kills a former slave worker named Drixco. Drixco slaughters a former amusement park worker who had joined the Autobots because of the bombing of six lasers over Cybertron. He goes for Optimus, who shoots him, and Optimus realizes he is now committed to this war. He questions if he is on the right side, for what side that kills could be the right one. The spaceport in most of the Eastern Hemisphere is claimed by the Decepticons, but this battle has marked Ultra Magnus' unit as the Wreckers, a crucial fighting force for the Autobots. Autobot spies report that Starscream rarely comes down to the spaceport and spends most of his time on one of the moons, watching Trypticon Station. Mind you, Starscream is still not considered to be the second in command. Next to fall is Polyhex, and the Decepticons claim the Satellite Command Center. Alphatrion is not surprised, since this area had belonged to Ratbat. Then, Crystal City is destroyed by the Combiner Devastator. The ancient art of combination has been taken to extremes by the scientist Shockwave, and the Combiner is made of seven Constructicons. Alphatrion particularly laments the loss of the Science Center, but he calls this destruction the most beautiful thing he's ever seen, such a rainbow of lights. Alpha Trion wonders as Megatron slaughters Autobots if he realizes how far he's gone from his ideals. He talked about the value of life no matter one's guilt, yet he has taken so many lives. The Autobots abandon Crystal City to protect Kallus. Starscream does not send Seekers to fight with the Decepticons here, and for the first time, the Autobots come out victorious and the Decepticons suffer heavy losses. This win clearly signifies the importance of Starscream's military to the Decepticons, because the gladiators on the ground have only hand-to-hand -hand combat weapons, and the Autobots and Kallus were able to shoot them down with long-range missiles. The Combiner Bruticus is sent in and defeated, the components so badly damaged that they do not think they can combine again. Alpha Trion believes that Starscream is purposefully absent in Kallus to gain more worth and power in the Decepticon strategy. Alpha Trion then mentions Tarn and two cities that had been rivals since ancient time. Each city was given something to pacify it. Tarn became Cybertron's sports center, while Voss became the Air Command headquarters. Tarn surrendered itself to the Decepticons, and Shockwave started designing the city into an ideal Decepticon state. The centers became his experiments. But while Starscream is in space, Shockwave and the Decepticons under his control take over Voss and start fueling the rivalry between Tarn and Voss. The cities end up firing missiles at each other, and Shockwave encourages Voss to fire at a certain area in Tarn holding Autobot synthesizers. Voss essentially nukes half of Tarn, and Shockwave blames it on Iacon and the Autobots. Then, out of the blue, the entire city of Voss is vaporized, killing thousands of Seekers in their Starscream's command. Shockwave claims to not know where the strike came from, but when Starscream is critically weakened, he takes the position of second in command, seemingly Megatron's first second in command. The survivors of Voss feel betrayed by the Decepticons and have even lost faith in Starscream, so they join the Autobots. This will explain the presence of a few, like the Aerial Bots, among the Autobots. Quickly, Alpha Tri notes that Starscream spends most of his time in space, but when he fights, he is undeniably brave, even to the most partisan of Autobots. That title of coward is far from Starscream at this time. There's also a great battle over Paxis that was so brutal to both sides that no one knows who won. It had been a city of engineering and for scientists of Crystal City and Nova Cronum to present their findings. It was also home to the Helix Gardens, a beautiful place. Everything is destroyed and thousands have died over this land. Megatron has also expected that the citizens of Praxis would have supported his side, but when they did not, Megatron's tolerance for neutrality became worse. Those who would not commit enough to his cause would be terminated, so Megatron is becoming darker. Icon is constantly under siege. Optimus wonders if he is destined to lose, how many lives will be lost because of his drive to continue fighting? We get a brief mention of the records holding their own at Taken Heights and that they have created an Autobot Combiner to protect their bot, Defensor. 
At the horrible battle of Tiger Packs, Optimus has the Allspark launched into space. The well had become mostly dormant since the start of the war, as though Primus knew what was happening. But then a generation was released, most of which joined the Autobots, and among them was Bumblebee. He is an energetic young bot who learns from Optimus and his closest advisors, Ironhide and Jazz. However, at Tiger Pax, this is where Megatron removes Bumblebee's voice box. For now, he simply cannot make a sound. Megatron is sick of the fighting and wants the war over already so that he can rebuild a society where everyone can discover what they are good at. Megatron wants to lead a strong Cybertron as its prime and recontact the lost colonies, but now his ambitions for taking the galaxy are growing. The Autobots have been holding on for longer than Megatron expected, and he does not think brute force will win. He has his spies looking for powerful artifacts and the secret of Trypticon. Finally, after so many years, Soundwave spies are pulling up ancient, hidden information about the Sparks of Unicron. The stories say pieces expelled from his body have been collected, called Dark Energon, a very dangerous material. That only interests Megatron, and apparently, this forbidden substance has been locked away on Trypticon. Megatron decides it is now time to pay Starscream a visit, who he now sees as his secret lieutenant, but explicitly is not second in command. Alpha Tri and Nose have discovered the secret of the Seekers, and he hopes that Megatron will destroy himself with the Dark Energon. If he doesn't, they are all in great danger. Megatron comes to the space station and Starscream meets him with a backup group, so the atmosphere is hostile. Megatron starts telling him to explain what he's been hiding. Starscream honestly says that they're not sure, which is why they have been monitoring it. He then explains that keeping it far from the Autobots was a good thing, even far from the Decepticons, because if it had harmful effects, the Decepticons might have been devastated and lost the war. Megatron counters that they might have won the war. Starscream in his Prime Prime sass tisk tisks him, saying that he doesn't know that. Megatron grabs him by the throat, threatens him, but Starscream is a smug little thing and isn't even concerned. Megatron can't kill him because he needs the Seeker so badly. Megatron lets go of Starscream and orders him to show him the Dark Energon. Starscream claims that he's not seen Dark Energon for himself, but he entrusted it to his Seeker Engineer Lieutenants, Bitstream and Hotlink. You'll notice that Starscream actually has six lieutenants, many specializing in science. So Starscream again argues that he's not a traitor since he had not let his Seekers consume the Dark Energon for potential power. Megatron says that he was smart enough to be afraid of it. Starscream claims that he is surprised at Megatron, a gladiator who has the diplomat skill of backhanded compliments. Megatron's extra layer of feelings for Starscream is revealed. He calls Starscream a creature of caste, just like any Autobot pretender. See, now Starscream has lived a privileged life in the military caste, and so Megatron holds hatred for him, already based on that. The Autobots know that Megatron is on Trypticon. Optimus and his closest bots are gathered, and Alpha Trion walks in with the explanations. He asks them what they know of Energon and tells them it is the essence of Primus. So then what would the essence of Unicron be? Alpha Trion continues, saying that if the Decepticons took Dark Energon, they would become sickened bots, for anything derived from Unicron is ultimately fatal to life. However, before it is, the Decepticons might have the power to destroy them all. The other bots are wondering what to do, then suddenly they get a request from Starscream to meet. Optimus is not sure if Starscream is setting up an ambush, or if he wants to defect to the Autobots. No one wants to go, so they ask Starscream to find a place to set up a secure channel for a video conversation. Optimus ponders how great it would be if they could get the Seekers on their side. When the call opens, however, Starscream is smack right to the point. He says, Two things. One, if you don't know what Dark Energon is, you need to find out. Two, I need to know what to expect from you if something should happen to Megatron. Optimus, of course, says he wants peace. Starscream replies, understood, then hangs up, confusing Optimus. Megatron had wanted to kill Sentinel, but Starscream has always been strongly against it because he thinks Sentinel could be a future bargaining tool. Sentinel has been locked up on Moonbase 1. Starscream visits him, angry. He says, You Autobots believe in redemptive action, atoning for failures of will. Things like that, right? Sentinel denies being an Autobot, saying that he is neutral as a prime. Starscream responds that if he had a chance to redeem himself for his cowardice at Aldehex, he would take it. Sentinel is enraged, but Starscream continues. He calls him a coward for abandoning the people who needed his protection and leadership. Close to Sentinel's face, Starscream says this made him decide to commit to the Decepticons. 
Sentinel Grimms, questioning how committed Starscream really is. He also claims that time has taught him and he's not the same bot anymore. He's willing to fight Starscream. After Starscream leaves, Megatron calls him and asks him where he is. Starscream simply tells him, getting repairs done on Moonbase 1. Megatron orders him to return to Triptychon to see something regarding Dark Energon. While Starscream was out, Megatron and his gladiators ravaged the scientists, killing those who did not submit. Starscream is shocked, but the station is now Megatron's. Starscream finds his science crew missing, replaced with new scientists. Shockwave is also present. Starscream rushes through the station, grabbing someone and demanding that they tell him where his crew is. He points out the clean room, and inside, Starscream finds his crew restrained, wounded, and some missing their voice boxes. Megatron creeps up behind him and says this is what happens when his superiors find out he cannot be trusted. Megatron talks about giving the station a spark, but Shockwave says there is no new sparks to put in it. Megatron then indicates the prisoners and claims that their sparks can be used. The prisoners cannot cry out, and what happens next to some of them is so bad that apparently Starscream turned his head because he could not look. Next, Megatron tells Starscream to pick two of his own staff to test Dark Energon on. Starscream hesitates, and Megatron wonders if he pushed Starscream too far. He wanted to break Starscream and control him by doing this, not make him snap and have to kill Starscream. After all, he still needs Starscream. Yet Starscream does submit, and he chooses two victims. These two are restrained in another room, and there Shockwave force feeds them both a small amount of Dark Energon. They spasm, collapse, then suddenly are filled with immeasurable strength and tear themselves free of their bonds. They fight off the guards easily until the lab's defenses fire upon them, knocking them, the guards, and the scientists over. Megatron is so impressed by the strength and resilience that he immediately gives himself some Dark Energon. Megatron feels power like he never had before, as though he had been a struggling weakling all his life until now. He is fueled with bloodlust and wants to tear apart waves of enemies, and he sees the same violent hunger on the faces of the test subjects. Megatron says to them, yes, it is not enough, isn't it? Starscream is shaken, he creeps over to the fallen scientist, Autoclave, helps him to his feet and whispers, how much more Dark Energon is there? Megatron hears them and crushes any dream of destroying the Dark Energon. He asks them how more can be made. Autoclave leans on Starscream and goes to the computers, showing how Dark Energon corrupts regular Energon to create more of it. The problem is that Cybertron is running out of Energon. Starscream starts slipping out of the room, and Megatron tells him that he might let him have Dark Energon when he returns. Jazz and a small team of Autobots are hit by the first group of Dark and Decepticons. It is a nightmare as the Decepticons fight as though they feel no pain, so invigorated to kill. Everyone but Jazz is slaughtered as they try to run, which is all they can do. These bots are unstoppable, and Jazz flees for his life. Decepticons start brutally massacring groups of Autobots here and there, exactly what Optimus feared would happen. But they cannot destroy Trypticon Station when Decepticon Seekers by far outnumber the Autobot ones. Optimus does notice, however, that Decepticons are not holding onto the land they conquer, meaning that they have a huge Energon supply problem. He discovered that the weakness of Dark Energon is that it gets burned up more quickly. Optimus decides that the Autobots must continue the run to make the Decepticons chase them and burn up their Dark Energon supply. Megatron thinks about the successes of Dark Energon. It has made his forces nearly invincible, but whenever they run low on fuel, the Autobots are able to win the battles. Megatron thinks of the taste of Dark Energon to be sweet, but it is the power that makes him addicted and want more. They start experimenting with the two test subjects, seeing what would happen if they only gave them regular Energon from there on out. Now they have to be restrained as the absence of Dark Energon agonizes them. Megatron decides he will never let himself go with this insane, even if he has to drink the darkened blood of everyone else. Megatron wants to bring up a large supply of Energon to trip the constellation to darken, and Soundwave brings up the geosynchronous Energon bridge. Megatron summons Starscream to make this happen. He tells Starscream to put the station first into orbit before doing something else for him. Starscream, because of his boredom in space, looks forward to flying missions, but now must undertake this one. At last, Starscream and his lieutenants try Dark Energon for themselves and instantly become addicted. They blast through Autobot resistance and make it into the tunnels below Crystal City. Being underground makes him uncomfortable, but the Dark Energon urging him to fight makes him restless. The Seekers find the Energon Bridge very quickly due to their deep experience in searching for things. Meanwhile, Megatron is pacing in front of Force Psych because he is uncomfortable with giving Starscream such an important mission. But he considers the Seeker Commander, believing that his skill gives him too much value. 
Megatron thinks that he's a superb flyer, officer, soldier, and advisor. When Starscream is successful, he is satisfied but not surprised. That title of being a failure has not yet fallen upon him, as you can see. Starscream is kept waiting in the underground of the bridge as it activates, and while he is there, he secretly contacts his seekers and tells them that Operation Unlock has commenced. Megatron likes to make appearances among the southern cities to remind him that he is one of them. He steps out and addresses a huge army, rallying them for the final attack on Iacon. Then he returns to Trypticon where the scientist, Catalicon, reports that this Energon bridge still won't generate enough Energon for his massive army. Soundwave says that there will be enough if they control the plasma energy chamber below Iacon. Megatron had thought this was a myth, but Soundwave's minicons have found out about it when spying on Crystal City. They need two keys to control it, justice and power. Megatron sends Starscream and his lieutenants out again to get the key of power underneath the High Council chamber. They use underground tunnels, flying swiftly and blasting any lone Autobot they find before the enemy can be alerted. At the same time, he himself leads a group towards it. He follows the map underground and arrives at the location, and from the shadows, steps Sentinel Prime. Megatron did not know of Operation Unlock, but he knows this is Starscream's doing. It looks like Starstream has given Sentinel the chance to kill Megatron, and Sentinel is definitely upset with him. He says that Megatron was a killer from the start, for long ago when Megatron was only a crime boss, Sentinel had sent two bots to investigate him. Both were murdered. To that, Megatron counters that two is nothing compared to the millions who suffered under Sentinel's caste system. Sentinel then claims that Megatron will keep telling himself that even when Optimus is impaled by his sword, but Megatron believes that Optimus and the institutions of the past shall die. They engage in a sword battle filled with taunts. Megatron expresses that Sentinel cannot atone himself, dying for an idea he never believed in. However, Sentinel is a changed character, brave and fighting now to make a future better than the past. On Dark Energon, pain only makes Megatron more excited for violence. He wears down Sentinel and ultimately cuts off his arm. The cry Sentinel releases is said to be more than pain, but he's lamenting of all he would never do for the future. Megatron slashes open Sentinel's chest, and then inside, he's amazed to see the Key of Justice. Starscream has, in the meantime, found the Key of Power and is flying back. As he flies, he thinks about how Dark Energon is ruining the Decepticons, turning them into bots, starving for more. He decides he is going to stop using Dark Energon, because a planet of addicts is not worth fighting for. Starscream arrives on scene as Megatron cuts off Sentinel's arm, and the Seekers sneak around to form a ring. Starscream creeps up behind Megatron as he looks at the Key planning to seize it from Megatron and have both. Just before Starscream can grab it though, Blackout sees Starscream and cries out, Megatron, look out, and throws himself in Starscream's path. Starscream had not actually known Sentinel had the final key, and until he saw it, was likely planning to kill Megatron underground while he was distracted by the fight. Now, Starscream pushes Blackout aside and Megatron immediately attacks him. Starscream and Megatron thus launch into an epic battle spanning some pages. The first shot got Starscream off guard, and as he gets to his feet, Megatron taunts him for being at a disadvantage, for down here there is no room to fly, and Megatron is naturally stronger than him. Charging at Starscream in tank form, he thinks the Seeker cannot escape, but Starscream half transforms to blast himself to the side just in time. Then, they engage in pure hand-to-hand -hand combat, both high on Dark Energon. Megatron's punches are incredibly powerful, but Starscream is very agile and fast, spinning and dodging, and striking faster than Megatron can react. Megatron notes that this is the Seeker in him, but Megatron withstands the blows and waits for Starscream to get arrogant and sloppy. The moment Starscream gets too confident and isn't careful with his balance, Megatron takes him to the floor and pounds him into limpness. Then he picks up the battered Starscream to intimidate the watching ring of Seekers. He still decides to keep Starscream alive, so long as he lets the coup attempt be a thing of the past. Starscream is so hurt and humiliated that he can only glare, but Megatron lets him. Then Megatron makes a show out of honoring Blackouts, who had warned him. He even grants him the honor of putting Sentinel Prime's body in the pits of Chaos he hated. Then he humiliates Starscream again by making him hand over the Key of Power. Megatron takes the key and feels euphoria, sure that this marks the downfall of the Autobots and the start of a great era. These keys unlock a door into a room and inside, there's a small cylinder glowing on a pedestal. Yet before Megatron can even touch it, several things happen. Cut back to Optimus, he knows Megatron and Starscream are below this city and he is planning a counterattack. 
That is when Alpha Trion comes in, saying that the plasma energy chamber is in danger of falling into Decepticon hands, so Teletran 1 has reawakened Omega Supreme. Megatron and the Decepticon stagger as the room begins to transform. The plasma energy chamber is encaged in the sense, escaping Megatron. Then, the ceiling begins to collapse. Outside, the Autobots watch the High Council Tower descend and start to rise as something else. The thing is, Omega Supreme was thought to be a mythical character, protector of the Prime's relics. To see him now is like seeing a story come to life, and Optimus wonders what other stories could be true. Omega Supreme in alternate form starts to fly away, carrying the plasma energy chamber to safety. When everything in the tower was collapsing, the Decepticons were racing to safety. The scientist Catholicon gets crushed, and Megatron notices Starscream looking up for an opening to escape of his seekers. Megatron calls him out, that if Starscream flees and leaves him to die, then he will kill Starscream when he survives. But if Starscream flies out on a mission to stop Omega Supreme, he may leave. Starscream asks for a reward in Dark Energon, unable to hold back his craving. Then, he and his six lieutenants go to battle with Omega Supreme. Omega Supreme calls the Autobots, saying that he should have been awakened before things got so dire. Optimus replies that they had not known, but then suddenly, seven jets in perfect formation escape the damage zone. The few Autobot Seekers are not around at the moment except for Jetfire. For a long time, Jetfire has been trying to work out a way to convert ground Autobots into flyers, but it seems to be a scientific dead end. They cannot take on Starscream and his lieutenants, but they can look for Megatron and try to stop him. Omega Supreme has absorbed the basic facts of the war from the grid, learning that 85% of Cybertron is under Decepticon control. Three council members are still alive but on the Decepticon side. The Allspark has been injected, and Sentinel Prime is dying. He slows to combat the seven Seekers following him. In the heavy fire in the sky, Optimus, with his naturally sharp eyes, watches three of Starscream's lieutenants get killed. They're not named, but we know the survivors, thus Hotlink, Bitstream, and Nacelle have been killed. The Seekers come out victorious and down Omega Supreme, and Megatron beats Optimus to him. They are outnumbered and Optimus considers the retreat, wondering if the loss of three most powerful Seekers and many of Megatron's gladiators, who have been crushed, would count as a victory. But Jazz knows they can't let the Decepticons have the plasma energy chamber, and so he starts the battle for it. Optimus and his three closest Autobots will fight Megatron, a dozen darkened soldiers, and the three Seekers on their own. But then, Omega Supreme rises from the hole in bot form, and the sight of it is the most inspirational thing Optimus has ever witnessed. They roar into battle. Omega is big, but not Metroplex or Triptychon big. The gladiators take him down, so incredibly powerful from the Dark Energon. Every time one of them dies, the Dark Energon leaves their body as though alive, and it worms its way through into the other Decepticons to make them stronger. During this fight, Ironhide takes a hooked chain whip to the face and is terribly damaged. In the end, Megatron stands over Omega Supreme's exposed spark, taunting the Autobots that he will kill him. Starscream has just landed with his remaining three lieutenants, which we'll learn in Exiles to be Thundercracker, Slipstream, and Skywarp. Megatron tears out the plasma energy chamber and says that this is why Autobots should stop hiding the important things inside their bodies. Megatron will leave Omega Supreme alive if the battle ends now, and so he drives away of the energy chamber and Omega Supreme survives. Optimus gets Ratchet to repair him and resolves that the Autobots will have to get the energy chamber back another day. Things aren't all bad, for apparently more Seekers have been joining the Autobots lately, and Optimus hopes that with Starscream's ambition and the Dark Energon Addicts, the Decepticons will tear themselves apart. Unbeknownst to him, Bumblebee has snuck off to follow Megatron. Megatron corrupts the plasma energy chamber and puts it in the geosynchronous energon bridge, henceforth creating an infinite supply of dark energon. He realizes that he could win the war by never fighting again, letting the Autobots starve to the point of needing dark energon for fuel. But he does not want that, for the gladiator in him wants to fight for his victory. Bumblebee sees what Megatron has done and cannot do anything but report the horrible news to the Autobots, that Cybertron is now producing dark energon instead of energon. At this time, Optimus and his friends are looking through the wreckage zone for Sentinel Prime, said to have been possibly alive since Megatron had severely wounded him but not killed him. Optimus tells the others that he believes Starscream released Sentinel in an attempt to terminate Megatron based on the vague video call they earlier had. Jazz is pessimistic, 
thinking they are wasting time looking for a sentinel, and Optimus should worry about the living. Then Prowl calls him and claims that Sentinel Prime just sent a message, and Optimus realizes that is why he couldn't find a body. Prowl used to be a local police officer for civilians and he is good at investigating. He believes that the message from Sentinel came from the south, in Kaon. Optimus wants to withdraw all Autobot forces to Iacon, but Bumblebee with his patchy vocoder in his throat says that it can't just leave Sentinel to die. His youthful concern shuts everyone up and they realize he is right. Even if Sentinel was not an Autobot before, he has changed. Jazz is bitter about how long it took him, but he thinks this is a trap set up by Megatron or even Starscream, because in his words, that Seeker has more schemes in him than Ironhide has scars. Ratchet steps into the meeting and says that Omega Supreme will live. Optimus asks how long before he can fight again, since the situation is so dire, but Ratchet is quite offended on the patient's behalf. Optimus feels embarrassed for being so thoughtless and he plans to later apologize to Ratchet. Then he thanks Bumblebee for bringing him news even if it is bad. Optimus tells Alpha Trine that he is planning to go to Kaon to save Sentinel, the one whose title he appropriated. Alpha Trine assures him, telling him that the High Council bestowed the title upon him for a reason. He also reveals to Optimus that he was the one who had put the idea forward. Alpha Trine supposedly tells Optimus some very important information before he picks a team and goes to Kaon Prison. With him he has Jazz and Prowl, and for backup, Bumblebee, Jetfire, and Sideswipe. It is easy to get close to Kaon because Decepticons don't think Autobots would be stupid enough to travel there, and Optimus tows a trailer of machine parts and gets past a board sentry. They head to the Black Pyramid Optimus has been to before, which is lightly guarded. They silently kill a guard and drag away his body before stepping inside a place coated in dark energon. The former gladiator pits have become the prison, but most prisoners chained up are dead, left to starve to death without energon. The place is disgusting and resembles the underworld of Cybertron. Then, Optimus sees Sentinel Prime before he is suddenly ambushed by guards. These guards cry out in an underworld dialect that Optimus cannot understand, so it seems that the Decepticons have gotten along with the bots who lived underground. They end up defeating the guards and Optimus comes to Sentinel Prime. He is fatally damaged and dying, and he ends up telling Optimus to not call him a Prime, for he is no longer one. Sentinel thinks Optimus is the true Prime who will do better than he did, and he urges Optimus to help the Corps, for as Sentinel grows closer to death, he hears its voice speaking to him but growing weak. Sentinel passes away and Optimus cuts him free from his chains. They hold a small funeral for Sentinel and lay his body in a crypt in Iacon. With his death, Optimus' status as a Prime is more official. To Jazz, Optimus asks him how many of the 13 Primes might be alive, but Jazz calls them all mythical, so none. Optimus now journeys to the core of Cybertron with only Jetfire and Bumblebee. There are walkways down, built long ago, for once bots wandered out from the well aimlessly, but then settlements were built close to the well to teach the new bots about Cybertronian life. They come to a secret door to the core that Alpha try and let them know about, and they proceed. The dark energon has spread everywhere down here, and its effects start to mess with them. Jetfire becomes aggressive, thinking it would be fine for him to try some of the dark energon. Optimus warns him that he can't let the dark energon control him, otherwise he will attack them and they will be forced to kill him. Optimus assures Jetfire that they need him, and Jetfire submits to him but he is too proud to apologize. Then they come to a part where Dark Energon has rotted the floor, and they really do need to cling to the big seeker to get across. If they step on what looks like solid floor and fall, but Jetfire catches them and flies down to the core of Cybertron. It's a very long flight, and the Dark Energon dizzying them makes it feel longer. When they arrive at last, the plasma energy chamber attached to the core is seen poisoning it. Dark Energon spikes surround the core, and Bumblebee is so distraught that he pulls them away with his bare hands not caring as the harmful substance splashes all over him. Then, Optimus removes the plasma energy chamber, then begins to hear a voice speak. Primus tells Optimus that he has fought bravely but come too late, yet now he shall give Optimus the true title of Prime, for it was never to give by the High Council or even Alpha Trion. The Corps brings forth the matrix of leadership that even Sentinel Prime has never been worthy of. He absorbs it into his chest as Primus tells Optimus to let the wisdom of the past Primes guide him. Optimus does not have a body change to be made more physically powerful by it, but he is strengthened by certainty. Having the Matrix makes him fully aware of his responsibility to the other Autobots. 
and this will be the change in him that Ratchet later speaks about. Optimus becomes more serious from this moment on and confident in his right to be a leader. Primus now proclaims that Optimus must leave the planet because the core is too damaged to produce enough energon to fuel a civilization. It will take Eris to recover naturally, and he must protect the lives of the Autobots and one day return to Cybertron of the Matrix. As Optimus begins to leave the others, he tells them what they must do. But Jetfire is skeptical because to run out into space and hope to find Energon is a death sentence. Yet it is all they can do, and Optimus announces the building of a great spaceship, Project Generation 1. <laughs> Get it? Jetfire carries Optimus and Bumblebee home to Iacon, and along the way, the Matrix shows Optimus the lives of the other Primes. It is undeniable to him now that they lived. When Optimus announces the plan to leave Cybertron to the Autobots, there is a lot of protest. Bots would rather die on their planet than out in space, but Optimus explains that to stay is certain death from many ways. Jazz points out that if they are going to die, he would rather enjoy a spaceship ride first. Optimus would like Jetfire to create a massive diversion of smaller spaceships to hide the building of the Ark from Megatron. Still, most Autobots are not content with the plan, but they must obey. Optimus sighs out his concern to Alpha Trion, who is exhausted. Alpha Trion has been refusing his full Energon portions, insisting that they go to the fighting Autobots. Optimus considers making the order that he must take it, but Alpha Trion says he'll disobey. And what's he going to do? Throw him in jail? The Autobots have a large collection of small spaceships, and the Autobot Seekers have been patrolling the area to make sure Decepticons don't come close to see what they're doing. But the quiet on the side of the Decepticons has them wondering if the Decepticons are dealing with some massive problems. Cut the Megatron, who is asking Shockwave if it is ready. They are looking at a Frankenstein monster spark creation, a cluster of sparks forced together that had been taken from Starscream's scientists earlier on. The loss of the Endless Dark Energon is a blow to Megatron, but Project Trypticon is moving along just fine. Megatron has noticed the Autobots gathering and has seen from space their collection of little spaceships. Just as the Autobots planned, Megatron assumes that the Autobots are planning to leave the planet in them. Optimus announces that everyone will rendezvous at one of the abandoned space bridges, but Jazz claims that it doesn't work. Alpha Trion says they simply do not know if it works, since it has been a long time since it was used. Then he jokes that he is older than the space bridges and still functions. Later, Optimus is unhappy to hear that Alpha Trion has no intention of leaving Cybertron. Even with all the ships in the Ark, there's not enough space to take everyone. Alpha Trion says that he will survive on Cybertron and that Vector Sigma will protect him. Also, he believes it is time for Optimus to learn to live without him. There it is again, no convincing Alpha Trion to change his mind. The Autobots board their ships and take off towards the space bridge and the Autobots note that the Seekers who fly by are not engaging them. They believe Megatron thinks he is one and is letting them leave. The Ark is not actually finished yet, and this is a test run to see if they can make it to the space bridges and know if they can get away. That is when Trypticon Station fires a devastating dark energon beam that takes out two ships. It has total view of the space bridge and there is no way to get close. Jetfire snaps at Optimus, calling the Ark project a waste of energon and Autobot lives. Megatron then appears on everyone's screen and throws up a huge, terrifying army of Decepticons, claiming that it is time to discuss the terms of their surrender. He challenges them to fight the Decepticons and Iacon, before he has vaporized each ship and by now four have been destroyed. So Optimus calls for all spaceships to retreat and land. But the spaceship carrying Optimus sneaks and hides in an asteroid belt. They go into a blind spot for Trypticon as Megatron continues his video chat, not actually knowing where Optimus is exactly. Megatron apparently knows that Optimus has the Matrix, and the fact that he has found out shocks him. As Optimus sneaks up on Trypticon, he tells Megatron how far he has fallen, that he treats his own soldiers with little concern for their lives, that somewhere out there, a gladiator sees Megatron the way he once saw the High Council. This insult actually confuses Megatron for a moment. Optimus' ship attaches cables to Trypticon and they drill a hole and sneak inside. Jazz, Bumblebee, Prowl, and Sideswipe are with him, but then the station releases a few mechas to fire at them, and when defeated, the station reabsorbs them. Now they realize that Shockwave has given Trypticon life. They must fight off the walls, and they realize that they must eliminate the spark of Trypticon. 
They find the two with the cluster of sparks that give the station intelligent life that power its defenses. However, after shooting it, they find that the battle is not over. Triptychon Station crashes on the edge of the Mithric Sea with Optimus' spaceship still attached to it. They manage to survive and fly away, returning to Iacon and celebrating the completion of the Ark. It had been a well-kept secret, built in the hole in the well of all sparks. With Triptychon Station fallen, Optimus commands all the Autobots to board the Ark. However, this is the part where the battle is not over. Triptychon had been semi-sentient before the Spark experiment of Shockwave, and so they had not ended him. From the crash site, the largest bipedal Cybertronian Optimus has ever seen arises. Triptychon is heading toward them, and they need time. Jetfire offers to fly out with the flight-capable wrecker, Springer. That is when Ultra Magnus suggests that a team of Autobots, the Wreckers, stay behind. How can Optimus know when to return to Cybertron if no Autobots remain? The Wreckers promise to destroy anything the Decepticons might build. At that moment, Ratchet enters and announces that Omega Supreme is ready to fight and shall fight alongside the Wreckers. Jetfire decides he too will stay behind on Cybertron with the Wreckers, claiming that they will need a Seeker. One last time alone, Optimus tries to convince Alpha Trion to come with him. He cannot, but Optimus understands in his spark that Alpha Trion is one of the thirteen and he will be alright. As the Autobots take off in the Ark, Optimus looks back to his closest friends and thinks to all those names he knew but have died. Then he looks down below and sees the Decepticon swarming Iacon after he abandoned it, ransacking it. He knows Alpha Trion is escaping underground, and he thinks of all the Wreckers and Jetfire who are going to engage Trypticon. However, they will not be able to as Megatron commands Trypticon to take on a third form. A Nemesis class battleship, I see it, and he follows the Ark into the sky. On board he has Soundwave, Lugnut, and Starscream among many other important Decepticon names. On Cybertron he has left Shockwave, who suddenly realizes that Cybertron is his to remodel as he pleases. Shockwave's mission is to rebuild Cybertron and kill every last Autobot in his absence. It is not a promotion, Megatron stresses, but Shockwave keeping his seat warm for him. As the Ark flies again, Megatron calls Optimus on his personal frequency. Throughout this novel, Megatron has not stopped calling him brother even if it has been sarcastic. However, Optimus points this out, and Megatron claims that they will always be like brothers, bound together. Optimus shall not escape him among the stars, because Megatron will endlessly hunt him and find him. Optimus tells him to do so, for at least Cybertron will have a chance to heal in the absence of his madness. In his spark, Optimus knows how corrupt Megatron is. Cybertron is abandoned, but Megatron chases him because of a grudge. The Ark and the Nemesis pass through the space bridge but it malfunctions and collapses right after. The two ships are flung to different places, but the Ark detects that the Allspark is nearby. Looking around themselves, the Autobots do not even recognize these stars, for there are no diagrams of them. Bumblebee worries that they'll never find Cybertron again, but Optimus assures him that he knows the way back. The Matrix will lead him there, and it will light their darkest hour. Yes, Megatron shall chase him, and the Autobots will fight their evil wherever it will take them. And then, they will go home. And, whew, that was the whole novel, everyone. It took me many, many hours to make this and my throat really hurts. I'm going to need a break before moving on to the second and third novels. Exiles is a space trip that takes both the Autobots and Decepticons to Philosotron and Junkion as Optimus pursues lost relics of the Primes. And we may meet another member of the Thirteen. Retribution shows the Autobots and Decepticons arriving to Aquatron, only to discover, to their horror, that they are now trapped on the Quintesson Colony world. Both Autobots and Decepticons are being fed to the Sharkticons in the unjust justice system. It looks like they will have to band together to defeat a threat to Cybertronians from distant past. Stay subscribed for all the coming Transformers randomness and discussion videos.